The former nurse, Lucy Letby, has been found guilty of murdering seven babies and attempting to kill six others at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Between June 2015 and June 2016, babies who seemed to be doing reasonably well would suddenly collapse. Lucy Letby was the common factor. The verdicts make the 33-year-old Britain's most prolific baby killer. Lucy Letby, I sentence you to imprisonment for life. This was a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It's now a podcast about one of the worst serial killers in modern times. At 12.52pm on Friday, August the 18th, 2023, we brought you the news that a neonatal nurse was guilty of killing babies in her care. After a trial lasting for over 10 months and more than 110 hours of painstaking deliberation, the jury decided that Lucy Letby murdered seven babies at the Countess of Chester Hospital and she tried to kill six more. She was cleared of two further charges of attempted murder and the jury could not reach verdicts on six further allegations. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail. I've been in court throughout and have reported on the case as it developed. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week we've examined what's happened and brought you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. So Liz, today we've got a chat with a doctor at the Countess of Chester Hospital for many, many years. She got in touch with us a few weeks ago about what she'd experienced when she was working there. What she says is that there was this kind of bullying, toxic culture at the Countess at the time. And she kind of speculates whether, you know, this allowed Let Be to operate because people were deterred from going to management and making complaints or raising red flags about their colleagues. We heard from Dr Gibbs last week that senior doctors were having trouble getting managers to listen. So how difficult would it have been for nurses to get managers to listen or how comfortable would they have felt with going to managers? Welcome to episode 60, The Whistleblower. We are delighted to say that we have got someone with us today that can give us a unique insight into what was happening at the Countess of Chester Hospital around the time that Lucy Letby was operating. We are joined by Dr. Fiona McRae, who used to work there and is a whistleblower. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for talking to us. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. Looking back at your time at the Countess, what are your feelings? So I worked in the Countess until the end of November last year. I spent most of my time there in anaesthetics. I have not worked in anaesthetics since 2018. My experience of the Countess from about 2004 was working in a very toxic, bullying culture. What I've seen with regard to this recent case is... The statements that were put out by Ian Harvey and Tony Chambers are all too familiar because that's the sound bites in my experience. Intimidation. That's been used quite a bit in the last couple of days as well. We've also done an interview with a consultant who attended a meeting with Ian Harvey and Tony Chambers and said he came out of that meeting feeling intimidated. That would go to your point, I suppose, about it your was, own feelings. Yes, it was very much a fear-driven trust. Quite a few of my colleagues have gone off with work-related stress, a good proportion of them in my grade. But the, the undercurrent throughout theatres and intensive care and anaesthesia, it was this undercurrent of fear. People mm. were terrified because this policy had been brought in and if you were caught not following this policy to the letter, then you will be dealt with, disciplined. And people were fearful for their jobs. So it maintained a control on most people because there was this constant threat of, you know, job loss mm. and lack of livelihood. You told uh, us that once... 
they felt challenged. You became like a target. Yes, yes. You know, we, we as a group, in my grade in anaesthetics, we raised concerns in a very pleasant, constructive manner because we were interested in developing a happy work environment. And I couldn't understand. I thought that they, they mustn't know how they're making us feel. So we'll go and tell them and we'll say these are a few examples and then everything will change. There was an incredulity about them, that the fact that we were daring to complain. And there was this almost, we've allowed you to work with us. So oh, you should be grateful. So you should be grateful. Right. There was that sort of attitude. And if you did complain and complain repeatedly, and again, all in a very pleasant manner initially, there was definitely a target. I had a target on my back from maybe 2014 onwards. And if you look at the annual report from the hospital from that time, around 2015, 2016, when Lucy Letby was there, the hospital was in debt and had a deficit. And there was talk of an efficiency team. They wanted the hospital to become some kind of new, modern model of hospital yeah. and they were trying to save 20 million pounds a year so I wonder you know why was there this culture of kind of them and us with the managers and the doctors was it was it money driven each medical director or each person in medical management whether it be a doctor or whether it be a nurse wanted to be known for something to make changes so that they could then either get right. awards and then have a bigger pension or they could move on to a more lucrative position somewhere else and with Ian Harvey it was this model hospital was seemed to be his right. thing yeah. with Tony Chambers it seemed to be the the track and trace which was a huge amount of money that was that was wasted and we should just explain what that was <clears throat> that around that time there was quite a few stories about the countess being this pioneering hospital because what they wanted to do was put essentially microchips or some kind of tracking device in staff badges or staff swipe cards so yeah. that they could know where every member of staff yes. were and every every piece of equipment but it did generate quite a few critical stories at the time in the press because of the amount of money it was costing you know millions of pounds millions of pounds and then it all fell flat on its face because they hadn't gone through the proper process in that they'd not asked any of the staff. It had never been put to the staff in a consultation process whether they would agree to be tracked. And, that, it was, and, and it's funny you say awards because mm, it is. Um, there's that. a lot of coverage in the Daily Mail about the hospital bosses and how a lot of them, while Letby was operating and murdering babies on the neonatal unit, the hospital was singing its own praises yes. at various awards dues. Yes. Alison Kelly was pictured picking yes. up a lot of awards, yes. the director of nursing. Mm -hmm. There obviously was this kind of awards-driven yes. desire from management. Yes. Almost self-promotion. Yes. It's appearances with no sort of substance underneath. Mm. Yes. There was no addressing of this toxicity, which we know from the Francis report, you know, years earlier is directly related to patient harm, mm. you know, from the mid-staffs inquiry. Yeah. I was going to say, just explain what the Francis inquiry was. Yeah, please was. do. So the mid-staffs inquiry was into a number of, of deaths at Mid-Stafford Hospital. And it started with a lady called, I think it was Julie Bailey, whose mum yeah. had been taken in for a minor surgical procedure. I think she had a hernia or something. And two months later, she died in the trust. And... The daughter, Julie, felt bullied by the staff. She witnessed a lot of staff bullying other staff or managers bullying staff. So she witnessed a lot of this and she started this campaign and there was a public inquiry. I think there were a couple of mm. France's inquiries because Andy Burnham commissioned the first one and then I think there was a public inquiry when there was a change of administration. And the report came out, I think, in the mid-2010s, maybe 2015. From that, we had the Freedom to Speak Up Guardians. They appeared. But from that, 
he came up with 20 principles. And what he said was, over and over, he heard tales of bullying going on in the trust. He heard more tales of bullying than, than anywhere else. And he linked this directly to patient harm. Mm. Now, I've presented this to the trust, to my, you know, the Countess, over the years. I've drawn, you know, comparisons with yeah. this and said, look, you know, this in an anaesthetic department, bullying, mm. you know, when you've got patients on the table in front of you. Mm. You know, I've been pulled out of theatre on more than one occasion to be reprimanded over something ridiculous and, you know, then sent back in to finish the list. I mean, it was just that sounds unbelievable. terrifying as a lay person. I drew these comparisons, but I couldn't get anybody to listen. I couldn't get anybody to do anything about it in the trust. And, of course, that's what Dr Breary, Dr Jayram, Dr Gibbs have all said. We were going repeatedly to Alison Kelly, to Ian Harvey, and flagging these concerns and nobody would listen. I mean, it's testament to them that they didn't give up, really, and mm. that they... There's an argument to say they could have acted sooner, perhaps, but, you know, at least they didn't give up and eventually no. the police were called in. On that, Liz, they're, they're their own worst critics. I don't think yeah. many people are criticising the consultants for what they no. tried to do. No. Because you trust that your your leaders have your best interests at heart. And, of course, they, they've they got the advantage then because you are more likely to go along with them. And we've asked why they think they wouldn't listen and why they didn't want to believe that a nurse was murdering and harming babies. And it's a fear that it's to do with reputation and damaging the reputation of the hospital. But, you know, these were ba people's babies. What I believe is that they had their own agendas and if what you were saying didn't fit with their agenda, then you weren't listened to. One of the things that someone has told us, of course, that I didn't really clock this, actually, is that Tony Chambers was a nurse. Yes. And in this particular case, there seemed to be a sort of pressure to protect the nurse in this situation. There was a lot of other senior nurses who were managers. There could be the argument that they were desperately looking after their own and they didn't want to believe that one of their own was capable of this. I think they were far too busy looking at daft things. I was just going to say, were their priorities wrong? Oh, yes. You know, there were two, I remember, there were two excellent orthopaedic nurses in theatre. And I don't know what it was they did. They, they'd not sent a sample to the lab within a short window of time or whatever it was, I can't remember. They were both suspended. They were both investigated. There was all this business about, you know, going around telling people to take earrings off in theatre. That was the big focus. Or, you know, a, this obsession with theatre uniform and us all having matching shoes. There was one time, do you remember yeah. the Crocs? They yeah. first came out, all different, brightly coloured. And the staff all in theatre, because that's all we wear is, yeah. is clogs. We all went and bought our own Crocs and you could get the little studs to go yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. And, and everybody. And the patients loved them. They mm. brightened the place up. Every, you know, the staff were providing their own footwear. Mm. No, 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 no. Everyone has to have the same navy blue. So nobody could wear these crocs except those of us who, who were naughty. And <laughs> the trust then had to pay out for, for new footwear for all the, the staff. But the, the obsession with, you know, earrings were, and, and jewellery and, you know, eating a packet of crisps, walking down the corridor. I was reprimanded once for that because I was in theatre clothes, eating a packet of crisps. And I said, what's the problem? Well, it looks like you've come straight out of theatre, you're having something to eat, and then you're going back into theatre. I said, well, that's because I've just come out of theatre, yeah. I'm having something to eat, and then I'm going back into theatre. You know, it's all about the patient perception. Right. How would that appear to the patient? Well, and that also fits in with the agenda about, you know, reputation. How does it look if the police get called in and have to investigate one of our staff? I think there was a quote from Ravi Jayram where he said, we were warned that we didn't want the neonatal unit to become a crime scene with blue and white tape all over it. 
And, you know, if you're the parents of these babies and you're reading that and you're thinking, my God, you cared more about yes. what people thought about how your hospital looks. But also, that was never going to be true. They were never going to seal off the neonatal unit no, with crime no, scene tape. It's mm. saying to the consultants, if, we, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. But I think what you're kind of saying is they were kind of like steadfast that they were right once they'd made a... Mm. A decision about something can actually and no matter what evidence you showed them to the contrary, you were making it up. And Dr. Gibbs said to us that he thought he didn't want to believe, is what he said, that they did this to protect the reputation of the trust. But what he thought perhaps might have happened was they closed their minds too early that Letby was harming babies because they were worried about the reputation of the trust. So, why not investigate that? And why investigate somebody caught vaping on the premises? My friend was mm. pursued because she vaped on site. And she was pursued all the way through her breast cancer diagnosis and her surgery and her radiotherapy. And they waited for her to come back. And she still had this disciplinary to attend to because she vaped on site. Now, why investigate that? Mm. and refused to even look at this. Mm. That was Ian Harvey and Tony Chambers? Is that what they were in charge at that time? No, that okay. was just after they'd gone. That was the new medical director. Mm. But that culture of, I don't know, focusing on the less important things. Mm. And going after people... You wanted to control, because that's all part, the first part of bullying, isn't it, is, is trying to control. So it was going after people to, in order to control them. Can we ask you a bit about when Ian Harvey mm. and Tony Chambers left the trust? We know that the police were called in in May. It took them almost 12 months to decide that it was actually criminal, that some inflicted harm is the term that they used, was being inflicted on these babies. And... Lucy Letby was arrested in July 2018. Now, we do know that Ian Harvey had told Tony Chambers earlier that year, around about January, apparently, that he was going to go and retire that year. And I think he went, he left within weeks of Lucy Letby being arrested. Yeah. And I think Tony Chambers left around about a month later, but much more suddenly. I know that there was an extraordinary medical staff committee meeting called around about mid-September 2018. Mm. And the following day, it was announced that Tony Chambers had resigned and would be moving on. And what I should say is that what we now know, Fiona, is that just before that meeting happened, apparently Tony Chambers resigned. The inference being that he knew yeah. what the outcome of that vote would be, vote, a vote of no vote confidence of no in confidence. him. So can you just explain what sort of meeting that is and what's likely to happen at that meeting, Fiona? So the medical staff committee is basically um, all of the medical staff, all of the permanent medical staff in the trust. And we have an elected chairman and we have an honorary secretary. The consultant paediatricians actually did a presentation for the rest of the consultant body mm. or the medical body of the timeline of things because of the pressure from the consultant paediatricians an extraordinary meeting of the MSC was called for this purpose of a vote of no confidence mm. in Tony Chambers but it didn't need to take place and then because he, he'd resigned he resigned mm. yeah so can we just talk about when Ian Harvey left because that was shortly after the arrest mm -hmm. and I, I'm aware from a couple of people there was a leaving party but for somebody else where yes. he was asked about the ramifications of yes. let be can you walk me through what what you're aware of so my understanding is he was asked if this was all going to blow up would that have implications for him and his words i'm paraphrasing but he would be in the south of france and they'll have to find me first which of course, Liz, we did. Which we did, yeah. Of course, we did. We um, one of our one of my colleagues from the Daily Mail found Ian Harvey in the Dordoin in his farmhouse in the Dordoin. I say he and Harvey. He saw Ian Harvey, but he didn't speak to him. <laughs> uh, he saw his wife, who 
threatened to set the dogs on him and he didn't really get any information but we have had since had a statement from Ian Harvey and we can uh, discuss that later. You mentioned at the beginning actually Fiona about the statements you've seen that have been released by Tony Chambers and Ian Harvey. I mean they listen you know we, we have to be absolutely fair they talk about being willing to cooperate with any kind of inquiry does that not give you any confidence they will have to answer for their actions or lack of actions? Hopefully they will. I'm not holding my breath because my experience is that people are not held to account very often. One thing I would say is, listening to their statements, their statements seem to contradict what the consultant paediatricians were saying. And if you've got this toxic culture, it's a perfect place to cultivate somebody like this and that's the problem isn't it often when you get tragedies or disasters or you know murderers it's always kind of like a perfect storm of various things that allow them to yes to operate without people picking up on it for a length of time and certainly the consultants would say that you know the atmosphere and the relationship between them and management was like non-existent by the time the police were Mm. called in and They were desperate by May Mm. 2017 for her not to be allowed back on their Mm. unit, back anywhere near patients, and essentially force the hand of the executive team to go to the police. Yes. What would you like to see come out of any sort of inquiry into this case, Fiona? I would like to see a completely new Countess of Chester hospital you know you said before you you hated the expression lessons will be learned and it's it's such an easy thing to say especially when all the evidence points to the fact that we're walking around with blinkers on and nothing is going to be learned and I don't see how you expect to get the best out of your workforce if you're treating them so poorly I have colleagues there who are still experiencing the same bullying we were pushing for an external review of my department and we'd been pushing for this and we finally managed to get the medical director who took over from Ian Harvey, we finally managed to get him to agree to it in August of 2019. Now, the review didn't happen until last year after yet another meeting with CQC and this review has been done This review apparently has evidence of bullying and discrimination against certain groups in the department, by other groups in the department. It's been shared by two of the consultants in the department, and that's as far as it goes. And nobody seems, even with evidence from an external review, still nobody can do anything about the culture. You hit a brick wall all the time. I don't know if the Countess can recover from this, but if it can, it's going to have to take a complete overhaul. Right, Fiona, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for your insight and for coming in. So what Fiona was saying there was really interesting, and we should point out, Caroline, shouldn't we, that we've actually seen a copy of that review that Fiona's referring to there, which highlighted the bullying in her department it's probably only fair as well that we should say we put a lot of her allegations to the countess they've got a prepared statement that they put out soon after the verdicts actually which details how you know they welcome any kind of inquiry and that they will be supporting the ongoing investigation by Cheshire Police but because of ongoing legal considerations they can't really make any further comments Yeah, Liz, as you said, we did put those allegations to the Countess, primarily the ones that Fiona is making that relate to now, because obviously she was working at the Countess in the period where Lucy Letby was there and all the allegations around intimidation and a lack of accountability was highlighted. But obviously what she's also saying there is, in her experience, in her department, it hadn't changed. And as you said, There have been CQC reports since 2016 that we've seen that would seem to indicate a similar pattern. 
And that internal HR review that was carried out, we've seen a copy of that, which does seem again to indicate what Fiona is saying. Fundamentally, many of the elements of it are true. You know, she's retired now, but she was working there up until November last year. And in that anaesthetics department until 2018, when she talks about moving to a different department and actually feeling like her working environment dramatically improved. So it was clearly something in that department as well that was going wrong. We should just say as well, you know, Fiona also welcomed the idea of a public inquiry that's been so talked about by the families, by their solicitors and by the doctors who tried to blow the whistle on Lucy Letby, saying that that's the only way that the families will get the truth as to what happened. And last week, we heard that actually the government have done a slight U-turn and decided that they are going to upgrade the non-statutory inquiry into a proper statutory, full public inquiry. Yeah, so that announcement, Liz, that it's now going to be statutory, this inquiry, was announced just a few days ago. And in fact, in the last few minutes, as we were just putting the finishing touches to this edition of the podcast, we received word that actually that judge has now been appointed by Stephen Barclay, the health secretary. He has just announced in the last few minutes that it's going to be Lady Justice Thirlwall and she will lead that statutory public inquiry into what's called the circumstances surrounding the allegations made about Lucy Letby and the associated deaths and severe decline in the health of babies on her shifts on the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital. So that update about this inquiry and how it's going to work and who's going to lead it has literally just come to us in the last couple of minutes. To be fair to the government, Stephen Barclay did say that he met with the families and it was after that meeting when obviously they made their voices clear on Tuesday exactly that they wanted this to be a proper public inquiry. The most recent one I've done is the Manchester Arena inquiry, which was led by a High Court judge. And you may remember in that inquiry that he did issue some warrants, the judge in that inquiry, for some important witnesses. Now, Sadly, the most important witness, who was the brother of Hasham and Salman Abidi, had already fled to Libya. So that made things difficult for that inquiry. But theoretically, this inquiry, anyone that the judge wants should be called and would will be called. And Liz, you alluded there to the inquiry into Manchester Arena bombings being statutory and judge-led, as was the Hillsborough inquiry, as is the COVID inquiry currently taking place. And in fact, we've chatted, haven't we, to Elkin Abrahamson, who's a lawyer at Brodie Jackson Cantor, who's been involved as a lawyer in both of those inquiries. And he was explaining to us why statutory might always have been the best approach to this particular case. A statutory public inquiry, which is what is often called a public inquiry, is probably the Rolls-Royce of inquiries. It's set up by a Secretary of State. In this case, it would be the Secretary of State for Health. And the Secretary of State decides what the scope of that inquiry is. And the great thing about a statutory inquiry, as opposed to other inquiries, is that the person who chairs the inquiry, usually a High Court judge, but it doesn't have to be, has the power to compel people to come along to the inquiry and give evidence and to produce documents and You'll have seen recently the fuss over the Boris Johnson WhatsApp. If there's the slightest fear about documents going missing or people not cooperating, you're not necessarily committing a criminal offence when you mislead or even if you lie to an inquiry. And one of the things we're campaigning for is what we're calling Hillsborough Law, which will impose a statutory duty on people to cooperate with all inquiries under pain of criminal sanctions. It sort of makes you think, what's the point of any other type of inquiry? Yeah, and it also makes you think, why are people allowed to lie to inquiry? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing when when you speak to people, then they say, well, what do you mean there has to be a law to make people tell the truth? I know you said, Elkin, that a statutory inquiry can be costly and time-consuming, but surely the others aren't, is it going too far to say they're not worth the paper they're written on? I think it probably is, because you can have inquiries where everyone is genuinely keen to get to the bottom of things and achieve something, and that sort of inquiry can work well. 
In this particular case where you've got, you know, a serial killer on a ward, something that absolutely nobody would anticipate, and someone has been found guilty and gone to prison, the evidence showed in this case that she could have been stopped sooner. That's the question, really. Not that they could ever have predicted someone like that would be on their ward, but could they have done something sooner? Is that the sort of thing an inquiry would get to the bottom of? Absolutely. Uh, the hospital trusts have a duty to compile statistics about all sorts of issues, one of which would be a mortality rate. And an inquiry would be asking questions like, well, what were you doing to monitor neonatal mortality rates on the ward? That's interesting you say that, Elkin, because there was a spike in deaths that was noticed and the consultants were going to the hospital managers saying, we've got this unusual number of deaths and collapses, we've looked at the equipment, we've looked at the staffing, there's not a virus on the wards. We're baffled, essentially. They were saying, we're baffled. We don't know what's causing it. They got the Royal College involved to do a review. They couldn't really pinpoint what was going on. They had an independent thematic review from a neonatologist from a different hospital. He also couldn't really pinpoint why the babies were collapsing and dying in the way that they were. And the only common denominator was Lucy Letby. And we know at least on two or three occasions, the senior consultants went to hospital management and said, We think there could be something in this. What should we do? And the truth of it is that that they resisted going to the police for many months. And I think that is probably what the parents of some of these babies who were harmed and killed after the doctors went to the hospital management will want answers on because they will want to know why on earth it was allowed to happen. That presumably is something that any inquiry would look at. Yes, it is. I mean, that's the kind of question that the chair would be asking the witnesses. Why didn't you act? Uh, And really, there are, are, I suppose, three possible answers. One was, we just didn't think. One was, this was so unimaginable that we couldn't Mm -hmm. encompass that thought. And one is, we wanted to protect the reputation of the hospital trust. Thank you, Elkin, for talking to us. Thanks for your expertise. Really appreciate it. welcome. So that's it for episode 60. We'll be back next week. You can catch more of our post-verdict episodes on Mail Plus or wherever you get your podcasts. You can give us a rating and you can share the podcast. You can also follow me at Liz Hull or send us an email at thetrialoflucyletby at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Lucy Trial or follow me at Radio Caroline. See you then.